our vacation Bible school. We're excited about uh, this opportunity for our kids over the next few days. Going to be worshiping and praising and, and studying God's Word and being involved. And we're excited about that. And this morning, they're going to start our service off this morning. Let's welcome them as they come today. All right. Who's excited about VBS this week? Okay, kids. I know it's Sunday morning, but you're going to have to act a little more excited about VBS. All right. Who's excited about VBS this week? Woo! All right. Welcome to Weird Animals Vacation Bible School. I am your sing and play stampede leader. All week, we'll learn that Jesus' love is one of a kind. Everyone raise one finger in the air. Now, adults, you have to participate in this too. Everyone raise one finger in the air and shout, one of a kind. Do it one more time. Let's do it a little bit louder. One of a kind. Awesome. All right. So this week, we're going to learn our theme song for the whole week, and it's called All Around the World. So we're going to do this song, and we're going to learn the motions. Now, how many of you kids want to look around and see your parents doing the motions, too? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we're going to learn our theme song, and this is not only for the kids, but this is for the adults, too. All right, so let's learn our song for this year, All Around the World.
All right, give yourselves a big hand. What wild, fun singing. At Weird Animals VBS, we're surrounded by wild, weird, wonderful animal habitat. So I'm wondering, what do you think a habitat is? Anybody know? Anybody tell us what they think a habitat is? A habitat is a place where creatures live that have all that they need. Our creative God filled the world with lots of -of one-of-a-kind creatures, including you. Everybody point at yourself. Now, what about that word weird? You might think that the word weird is mean. But what weird really means is that it's something special, something unique, something rare, never seen before, one of a kind. So everybody look at your neighbor and say, you're weird. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're weird. So we're going to stand up again, and we're going to learn another song called Give It Away. And it talks about how God gave so much to us. He created, created us one of a kind, and we're going to give all we have back to him. I'm feeling good, good, good in a crazy way. God's love changed me more than I can say. Can't keep this in, gotta let it out. Gonna tell the whole world that your love is spinning me round and round. Yeah, it's turning me upside down. I can't believe the way you love me more than I can contain. I'm gonna turn around and give, give, give it away. a big hand. Each day, you can sit down, each day at Weird Animal VBS, we'll learn so many things from the Bible. The Bible is God's very own word to us. Each day, we'll learn a Bible point, an important thing to remember from the Bible. Today, we'll learn, even when you're left out, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter what. Whenever you hear someone say the first part of today's Bible point, even when you're left out, you shout, Jesus loves you. So even when you're left out, let's see if we can get a little bit louder than that. Even when you're left out, now today we're going to meet our Bible buddy, Axel, and he's going to share with us our Bible point today. Welcome to Weird Animals. We're discovering that Jesus' love is one of a kind. Most people who see me would say I'm one of a kind too. I'm Axel, and I'm a strange salamander called an axolotl. That's ax-a-lot-ol. 
You might think I'm one weird animal, but I think God made me in a pretty cool way. See, most salamanders start out looking like an axolotl, but they grow up, their bodies change, and they can leave the water. But axolotls are special. We're the only ones who stay like this for our whole entire lives. We live in the water all the time. Axolotls are also special because we only live in one place on the planet. That's a teeny tiny system of lakes in Mexico called Xochimilco. Even there, it's getting harder and harder to find us. We're what you call endangered. That means there aren't many axolotls left in the wild. Sometimes that makes me feel sad and kind of lonely. Do you know what that's like? Maybe you feel sad and lonely when you get left out of fun stuff. Like a birthday party, or a game, or even just a group of other kids. But I'm here to tell you that no one is left out when it comes to Jesus' love. In the Bible book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That means Jesus is with you every day, every night, when you're a kid, and even when you're a grown-up. Feeling like a weird animal? Remember, even when you're left out, Jesus loves you. All right, let's practice our Bible point one more time. Even when you're left out. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing our last song before we're dismissed to Sunday school. And I think everybody knows this song. We're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. How many of you know Jesus Loves Me? So we can all sing along. to our Sunday school class. Let's try our Bible point one more time. Even when you're left out. Praise the Lord. Vacation Bible School is going to be awesome. Uh, If you know somebody that wants to come to Vacation Bible School, uh, please let Sister Lorena or Sister Vasca know as quickly as possible. We'll still have some some uh, room for some more kids. So if, if you know somebody that would want to be here t- tonight or maybe the rest of the week, let them know as quickly as possible. Vacation Bible School is going to go through today uh, uh, all the way through Wednesday. Uh, so if your children are involved in that, make sure they're here every night and we'll have a blast. Aren't you excited about that? I'm excited that our kids have an opportunity to have their Vacation Bible School this year and worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to ask if everyone could stand. We're going to enter into our worship today. I'm excited to be in God's house. I want to come in here this morning. I want to have Thanksgiving in my heart. 
and a praise on my lips today. I wonder if we could just lift our hands right now all across this auditorium. Let's begin to worship the Lord. Let's just talk to Him for a few moments, God. Come into this place today to lift up your name, to glorify your name, to worship you. So thankful for this chance. God, I pray that you'd move in this house this morning. Let your spirit prevail in this place. Have your way in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's clap our hands to him right now. Let's all worship the Lord in song today. Let's praise him. Yes, we come to get a praise. We come into 
praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and praise Him for just a moment. Come on, let's lift our voice in this sanctuary today. Hallelujah. Isn't He worthy of your praise today? Ah, He's great and greatly to be praised in this house. Hallelujah. Everything that hath breath ought to praise the Lord right now. I bless the name of the Lord God Almighty. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. The Holy Ghost is in this house today. I've come to worship His name. The song was singing about Him being able to deliver. He's able. And the reason I know He's able is because He did it for me. And if He's done it for you, you ought to wave your hand one more time as a testimony of God's delivering ability. All across this place, God has done many wonderful works. And He's worthy of our praise today because He's that kind of God. He can deliver. He can save. He can touch. He can heal. We serve a great God this morning. Amen. 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 As our ushers are helping us, we'll receive this morning's offering. And as you're preparing to give your offering, we want to say it's good to see everyone in God's house. It's good to see all of our faithful saints again, but especially to our guests that are here today. We want to welcome you to Bethlehem Church and let you know we are thankful that you're with us today. Bethlehem Church, can we welcome our guests right now? Let them know we're thankful they're here. Amen. 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 We're so glad that you're here today. Amen. We do have some needs we need to take before the Lord today. Connie Garrison is in need of prayer. She's going to have surgery. And if you have a need, you can represent that by the uplifting of your hand. Believe God to do a great work in the lives of people who are in need today. Let's go to Him in prayer right now over all these needs. And let's also remember the remainder of this service today. God, we are so grateful for what we feel in this place. So thankful, Lord, that you are entreating us with your presence, God. You are blessing us today. God, I pray right now that you would move over the needs of this people. God, that you would allow your glory to be shown. God, that you would bless their lives, that you would touch them, that you would heal their needs today. God, I pray right now that you would move in a miraculous fashion over all the needs that are in this place. We know you're able. Put it in your hands. We trust you. We believe you. We'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. God, also pray that you would move in the remainder of this service. Let your spirit continue to minister, God, as your word go forth. God, I pray that you would help it to receive good ground today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Uh, we're going to ask today that if you're able, that you would march as the ushers lead you to bring your offering today as unto the Lord. today? Do you really have a praise today? Let me hear you. Do you have a praise? Oh, isn't he wonderful? 
Isn't he marvelous? How excellent is his name? How great is our King? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You may be seated. God bless you. So good to see you all here in the house of the Lord, worshiping him. Jesus said, they that worship him, not them, but Jesus said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, we have the truth and we have the spirit, so what keeps us from worshiping, right? I can't hardly hear you out there. I don't know. Is anybody out there this morning? All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's go ahead and warm up a hallelujah here. Warm up a praise. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to have one of our homegrowns with us today, Brother Chad Williams from St. Louis, Missouri now. And we want him to come and say a word and address you. Isn't it good to have Brother Chad and Sister Tosia with us? Amen. Amen. Brother Dwayne's son, in case some of you don't know it. Praise the Lord, church. And we serve a mighty God today. We serve a mighty God who's worthy to be praised. It's always a delight to be here and worship with my home church and family here. So thankful for the goodness of God. If you're wondering, you are in the right place today. Because there is a mighty God here who wants to do a great work in your life. And he will do that. There is nothing beyond his ability and his talents. And I'm so thankful for him. I thought I'd share a little something with you this morning. Once there was a Shakespearean actor who was known far and wide for readings and recitations. He would travel from village to village, and he would uh, put on a show, if you will. He was a professional. He had years and years of experience under his belt. And uh, he always brought his night to a conclusion by reading a song. It was the final moment, the conclusion moment, it was the moment that he looked forward to because he did it so well that he could bring the scripture in Psalms to life. And when it concluded, people would rise and they would give him applause and they would praise him for his ability. One night, his evening was coming to a conclusion and it was time for him to recite the psalm. Right before he did, there was a little boy sitting in the front of the crowd and he raised his hand and he said, do you think I could read the psalm tonight? Well, this is the actor's moment. This is when he gets to, you know, really feed his pride. And he's thinking, I don't know about this. But this is just a little child, so this little child could never do it better than I could do it. And so he allowed this little child to come up and read the psalm. The little child comes up and stands on the platform in front of the crowd. His voice is quivering, and he's reading the psalm. When it concluded, there was no applause. No one was standing but you could hear weeping in the crowd. This actor was astonished, wondering how this child just accomplished that. He runs over and he says, I've never been able to bring a crowd to this point. How did you do it? And this little child mustered up all the courage he had and he looked the actor in the eyes and he said, you know the psalm, but I know the shepherd. I know the shepherd. Can I encourage you today? You may know the Psalms, but let me encourage you. Make sure you get to know the shepherd. Because when you get to know the shepherd, that's when your life is transformed. When you get to know the shepherd, that's when this thing comes to life and begins to transform you. The shepherd's in the house today, and he'd like to bless you. If you're here today and you have talents and you have giftings, can I just tell you, they will never meet their purpose as God has intended until you get to know the shepherd and that relationship saturates your talents with his anointing and power it's so good to be here with you amen 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 hallelujah aren't you glad you can say the lord is my shepherd praise god good to have a brand spanking new one here today you know what that means that's a new baby new baby brother Joseph and his wife have had a newborn baby by the name of Joseph Blake West. Hold that baby up so we can all see it. Look at there. Look at there. Isn't that great? Welcome to church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I might mention to you uh, uh, 
propane gas uh, members of the little co-op we have here. The, uh, for your information, the contract is out June the 30th, June the 30th. So um, we will be contacting you hopefully a little later about new contract prices and whatever. Uh, so uh, you might keep that in your notes. Uh, June the 30th is the contract date is out. Now tonight, if you will, everybody listen closely. This doesn't usually happen. This doesn't usually happen here, but take notice. Tonight is going to be VBS here at Bethlehem, all right? It's already been announced, but in case you didn't catch it, it's VBS tonight and through on into what, what, what night? Wednesday night, Wednesday night. So I'm telling you that there will be no regular church service tonight. All right? In case you didn't catch that. No regular church service tonight. You can come and watch and look in and help if you want to. But we won't be preaching, praying, singing, shouting like we normally do. Okay? Look at somebody and say, did you get that announcement? What did they say? They said, did you get that announcement, didn't you? All right. Stand with me, if you will. An honor to one of the finest gentlemen in the world, one of the greatest preachers in the world, and one of my dearest friends. Uh, sometimes after Patrick passed away, we were over in uh, Eureka, California. I had known of this preacher for a long time, but really did not, was not able to develop a friendship, but we were over in Eureka, California, got to hear him preach over there, and he preached so well, and uh, we got acquainted. I wanted, I wanted Bethlehem to be able to hear this kind of preaching and meet such a great man, and we are privileged to have with us from the way up in the state of Michigan. Is it called that Albion? Is that sound? A-L-B-I-O-N? Is that the Albion? Albion, Michigan. And uh, we're missing his wife this week, but maybe the next time he comes, she'll get to come and be with us. Put your hands together and make welcome Brother Marty Ballestera and the Lord. Oh, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, everyone. I greet you in the name of Jesus, which is still the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I'm going to let you be hunkered down here just a minute. Lord bless you, you all may be seated. What a treat it is for me to be in the fair metropolis of Potts Camp in Bethlehem. One of the greatest gifts of friendship God ever gave into my world was the friendship of the bishop and the bishopress. Did I say that right? Reverend Sister Wilson. I'll tell you what. Bethlehem has been blessed over the years with just the most marvelous leaders, if you will. I hope to God you appreciate your pastor and the bishop in this church what you have here right now. Thank God for that. Uh, I have preached over a thousand revivals, pastored over 30 years. Uh, I can't, I've preached nearly 400 conferences and 70 some odd camp meetings. I don't get treated any better anywhere than I do right there. The hospitality and the kindness and the thoughtfulness and the love. I just want you to know you couldn't do it for my survival, and I just want you to, I just want to say thank you. The devil makes me say stuff, I don't know. But my heart has been entwined with theirs. We laugh together, we talk about the Bible together, sometimes we cry together. When you need someone to talk to, there's not too many people in this world that you can feel comfortable just to go talk to. And Brother and Sister Wilson have been that for 
sure to bring you into the soil. I feel, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I feel robbed not getting to be with the Pastor B here today. Do, do you all know what a great preacher he is? Have you heard yet? Have you figured that out? My Lord. I was telling Sister Wilson it was it, Friday. I was retelling the story or telling them the story about my mom and dad coming to visit. I had probably been married 20 some years by this time. And I was pastoring in, in South Bend, Indiana. I was there nearly 30 years. So mom and dad came, and dad sitting at the table, and I'm sitting at the table, we're waiting for our wives to come out of the kitchen. I said, oh, it's gonna be good to eat mom's biscuits again. And my dad looked at me, he said, well, I know what you're saying, son. Your mama is a wonderful cook. He said, but time has a way of exaggerating a few things. He said, you may not get to eat your mama's biscuits for 25 years, and then when you finally show up and you eat them, you say, man, just like I remember them, but if I was honest, I'd have to admit, I've been eating biscuits this good at the house all, all along. Uh, not too many guys can stand up and say that their wife is a better cook than their mama, but I'm one of those kind of guys. When I married her, she said, baby, I can't cook like your mama. And I said, if I wanted to eat my mama's cooking, I'd stay home with mama. I'd rather eat your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and be with you. you got to say, chew. And sometimes all folks need is just an opportunity to try and to do it. I married her. She'd never been out of the state of Michigan. It took her almost 50 years to get me to move to where she was raised. But if the girl hangs in there, she can pull it off eventually. First place I took her was Melville, Louisiana. She learned how to make gumbo, sweet tea, and what they call down there, cat head biscuits. And I knew I was going to have a good life. Shun, oh, no, no, no. That's what I'm talking about. I told you that story to tell you this. God has given you the cream of crop. The cream of the crop. If you've been constantly feeding from the finest of the wheat with this good bishop here, his wife, I pray that you will always honor and adore them and be thankful to God. Pray for them. Do all that you can for them. But when I pastored, I never had a pastor appreciation service in 30 years. I pastored for eight years before anybody in the church ever said, I love you, thank you for that, you helped me, you saved me, you blessed me, anything. They wanted my dad to come back and be the pastor. Oh my God, I wanted him to come back and be the pastor too, but he's gone. Well, now when I go back, well, I, I just focused on the children. They'd give me fives and I'd, you know, interact with them. I prayed them through, baptized them, they grew up. I married them. They brought their babies. Give Brother Ballester a hug. Hug his neck. Well, now when I go back, I'm treated like the fourth person in the Godhead. But it took a lifetime. You understand? But I'm saying always take every advantage of every special day, every holiday, every birthday, Christmas, whatever, to give honor to your pastor, to the leadership of this church, to your good bishop, and God will always bless you. Can I get a witness from somebody? You know, I was, I had never been to an ALJC general conference, and I got to go this week. I was overwhelmed, unbelievably overwhelmed with just outpouring of love and kind words and thoughtfulness and from everybody, not just one person, but everybody. Lord, I almost felt special. Just like this kid up there leaning against the wall wanting to go have a pity party. I don't know of any meeting I've ever, I told my wife, I don't know of any meeting I've ever been in my life where the people tried any harder to be more hospitable and loving and warm and welcome. Y'all are just a great bunch of people. Y'all know that? Has anybody ever told you that? Oh, give yourself a big hand clap, don't you? Thank you. Well, I packed for five days to go preach at a youth camp. I can't believe that I'm 70 years old and still preaching youth camps, youth conferences. I've still got about four to do this year. And I've wound up tomorrow when I get home. 
And by the way, I'm, when I, about supper time, I'm going to get me a kiss right there. Get me a kiss right there. I'm going to get me a food in the table. <clears throat> That's what I'm talking about. It'll be five weeks. But I'm not, I'm, when I get home, I still won't be the most important person because when you're on Pawpaw, the first thing you find out is that if Grandma has a choice between kissing on you or kissing on grandbabies, you lose every time. That's a no-brainer for Grandma. So she's been down in Florida for graduation for grandkids, and then she gets home Saturday, last Saturday, and her five sister, four sisters come in. So the five girls are in a league of their own. I will just be the chauffeur when I get home, but at least I get to hang out with some, some sweet people. Well, that's all the announcements. You may be seated. Let me tell you, the day that you repent of your sins will probably be, up to that time, the greatest day in your life. If, matter of fact, that experience is so awesome that some denominations completely misconstrue that as total salvation. But there's more. On the day of Pentecost, when people want to know what to do to be saved, the first thing Peter said was repent and be baptized every one of you. He said this in Acts 2.38. Every one of you. How many Southerners do I have in the house? Half of you. What happened to the rest of y'all? In the margin of the Southerner's Bible, where it says every one of you, it says all y'all. We baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall. All you English majors, that's progressive verb ending, meaning you can take it to the bank. If God says shall, it's going to happen. You don't have to beg for the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. And he wants to give it to somebody this morning, right here in this house. I believe that with all my heart. This will be your last opportunity to stand for several hours. So I would like to read to you from 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 6. One year ago this week when I was here, I had pain in my leg. Uh, it was red, hot, swollen. I thought I had something like cellulitis. Didn't know that I had blood clots in my leg and in my chest. And uh, the good people in this church that work in the medical profession in the city of Memphis, Pastor Voskis got me in to see a doctor on a Monday. They wouldn't let me come back to the house to get my underbreeches or nothing. They just sent me straight to the to the hospital and uh, I was told I'd be around for nearly two weeks and I was very surprised that, that uh, to be discharged the next day and my son took me home the great news is that I'm feeling wonderful God's been so good it's kind of some, sometimes like you just let go to get a better hold and God just gave me a chance to get fixed what was wrong, and I'm glad to be back up and running. I find, this is just me, but my mindset is, if God's done with me, can't nobody keep me here? And if he ain't done with me, you're not going to take me out. So that's how that works. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, and I'm reading verse 6. But godliness with contentment. Is great gain. And all the church said, Amen. God bless you. Shake hands with somebody uglier than you and you may be seated. It's taken some of y'all a long time. Well, while I'm still at the podium, I would like to I would like to read Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 17. It's a scripture I don't like. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh, and that's a progressive verb in the ETH, means he just keeps on making. 
He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So you better bow stare. You're not supposed to have any enemies. I know it. I feel like David sometimes. I'm for peace, but when I speak, they're for war. I, uh, I write three blogs. I'm an administrator on seven. I had over 100,000 people this month. Fuss at me. How, much, how many pats on the back you got lately? 100,000. That's a whole, that's a metropolitan area. Not everybody agrees with me, I found out. Brother Bowster, are you going to change? No, that's the good part. I'm not. Uh, but he said, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies. We sometimes think people are our enemies. I'm going to try to approach that this morning and tell you that people are not always your enemies. Uh, Ephesians 6.12 explains it, where I want to go with this. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, people aren't my enemy. He said, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, could it be that sometimes my enemies are my circumstances? And I'm having a hard time coping with my circumstances. And the pain that I have during those circumstances has become an enemy to me. I've seen people walk away from God because of circumstances. I've seen homes destroyed because of circumstances. Let me have Deuteronomy 33 and 25, and that will be the last scripture I'll read for a while. David the king said, The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places, meaning that when I got my inheritance, what they gave me was a great piece of property. I got nice, lush, green grass. I got palm trees, and there's a little, little brook flowing through by my house. And man, it's comfortable where I live. Y'all, y'all come. But have you seen pictures of Israel? Not every place looks like that. You know why there's so many stonings back in the day? There's rocks everywhere. I have pictures, graphics of, of the area that I'm going to be talking to you about for just a minute. It's just a, a hillside, a mountain, if you will, with nothing but boulders about this big. And if you tried to walk through that, it would cut your feet up. If you had barefooted, oh, you'd be bleeding. If you wore thin sandals, your, your feet would be sore. So here he says to Asher, that when the inheritances were given to Asher, he said, thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Bottom line is God's going to give you enough strength for every day. He, he, he started out saying, let Asher be blessed with children and let him be acceptable among his brethren. Well, to me, blessed with children means to be fruitful and to uh, be acceptable among his brethren is symbolic to me of unity. It's God's will that his work be prosperous, that it grow, that there be babes born in the kingdom of God. And you can't have revival anywhere without there being a spirit of unity to have revival. And you can't have unity without, and folks being acceptable among their brethren until you start overlooking each other's little idiosyncrasies. Every now and then the pastor side of me just jumps out and does a judo chop on somebody accidentally. I just go on. I'm not trying to. I preach the same everywhere I go. Okay. I don't know any of your business. I'm just talking. But the point is, God did not change the circumstances for Asher. He made him live in the most difficult. The Lord who can turn water into wine left that rocky mountain right there where they had to deal with that. But he did say, let thy shoes be iron and brass. Meaning God will equip you 
to survive in an element nobody else can survive in. You need to be comforted by this one thing. God knows how to protect you and keep you through what you're going through. Can I get a witness? Normally when you go to a shoe store, you pick up a shoe and you say to the clerk, do you have this in a black, in a 12D? You are large and in charge. You tell them what size, what color, and what style. You demand. You debate. Uh, um, the man, I mean. But at God's shoe store, they don't work that way. You're walking down the street minding your own business. Not business, business. And the Lord's leaned up against the door jam of his shoe shop. He said, Ballister, your shoes came in. My shoes, Lord, I didn't order no shoes. I know I ordered them for you. Let me tell you, when God puts a pair of shoes on you, these folks didn't order no shoes, iron and brass. God ordered them for them. And when you put on a pair of his shoes, they always fit the first time. Oh, you young boys, don't be putting your shoes on like that. When you buy your own, then you can do what you want to. But... He said, I call these shoes peace. Peace, Lord. Mm -hmm. You're getting ready to walk down Turmoil Boulevard. And I'm going to help you. There may be turmoil in your health, turmoil in your finance in your relationship, maybe even in the church, on the job. But somehow God is able to help you through all of that. Let me just do a quick illustration. Can I, can I get a volunteer right here? Thank you. Can you just face that way, bro? Over here. Thank you. Let's say that this is my understanding. And in life, you can't normally go any further than what your understanding will allow you to go in life. And you just go where your understanding allows you. But sometimes you go through things where you don't even know what to do or how to do it. And he is able to give you peace that passeth understanding and leaves your understanding right back yonder. And somebody said, how in the cornbread world did you ever survive that? And you don't know. But all you know is somehow God helped me through it. And that's where your testimony comes from. Can I get a witness? Thank you, brother. I won't linger long here because this is not really my sermon. I'm still, this is an announcement. Long runway, I may crash the fence. I don't know. And another time, he may, he may pull up a, call you into his store because he has another pair of shoes. And he puts them on you. He said, I call these grace. Grace? You know what? There are some alleys in living the life that you're going to walk down. People are going to talk about you, say things about you, discourage you. You're going to walk down, oh Lord, what would you call it? Anything from disappointment alley to, oh, I don't even make any difference. There's sometimes it's only the grace of God that just keeps a smile on your face where you can keep on keeping on. Back. back. Uh, let, let me just finish with this one right here, and I'll, I'll get off in a second. One day he calls you into his shoe store, and he puts a pair of boots on you. Boots, Lord? Mm -hmm, boots. He said, "I call these, I call these worship." This is just me, Bishop, and you can fix this when I'm gone. Everyone is required to praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath. But worship is a d dimension that not everybody can get in because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have a dimension here that folks out in the world don't have. We have the spirit and we have truth. And that just automatically puts us into a whole new level of praise of the Lord. Amen. Boots, huh? You're getting ready to walk through the valley of despair. 
And these boots are going to be the only thing that's going to come out the other side. I was told that you could worship, when I was a young man, that you could worship your way out of whatever you're going through. Maybe you all sing it for altar call here, I don't know, but Sister Nancy sang a song when I was a teenager. She said, these boots are made for walking. Walking's what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are going up. Most of your carnal people are sitting back over here, Pastor. I just, I just say. The devil makes me do stuff. Well, y'all are sitting down. I'm out of Well, it's not important, but I do have the time. We get out at one, is it? I'm a frequent flyer. I fly for you. Sometimes I fly five and six times a week. Not that many trips, but I need to change planes and get up in the air. And that's how I got my blood clot some point. Every now and then, I get on an airplane where the flight attendant remembers me. You fly certain places. Some places I've been going to since 1972, so some things become familiar after that. So this one particular day, I get on the, on the plane... <clears throat> And flight attendant recognized me, said, well, good morning, Reverend. Glad to welcome aboard. I said, I said, can I see your ticket? I said, oh, uh, you're in 10 D. It'd be right back on the left. And that is my subject today, the passenger in 10 D. So I went on back to my little place and I sat down and there's a mother sitting right here. She's got a little baby. I say little baby, it's a year, year and a half old, something like that. She has a damp rag on the baby's head. The baby's sick. I thought, oh God, I sure don't want to come down with no fever. She got the flu. I sure don't want none of that neither. So I, I said, well, don't worry about the baby. I, I got 14 grandkids and number 15's on the way. My wife and I had five babies. I'm, I'm pretty child too. And she said, oh, thank you. She said, you, you grandpas are dear. So I had my little iPad and stuck it in the little seat in front of me, trying to get settled in. And I, and about a four or five year old brat, a kid brother, was behind me. And his feet was back up there on the back of the seat and he was playing with his iPad and his mother had headphones on. She couldn't give a big quack about what was happening. Oh God, I sure know how to fix this place. So I'm sitting there and my back don't stop doing that. About once a minute, I'm getting one of them. And because the kids, yes, and he's so happy to make that point. Oh, and he's excited about it. And the plane takes off. And the baby's coughing. And then it starts to cry. Did I mention the baby was crying? And I thought, you know what? This, this probably is not a good seat for me to say to him. The baby, I'm not so much worried about baby crying because if I moved anywhere on the plane, I'm still going to hear the baby crying. Good Lord knows you got young and babies going to cry, especially with taking off and, and coming back down on airplanes, air pressure changes in the ears. I know all that stuff. And then the baby uh, started having an upset tummy. And so the mother got the little bag out and um, benefited from it. She's apologizing, and I'm trying 
to reassure the mother that all, all is well. And, and I turn my head to give the mother the look. And the mother can't catch on. Oh, God. The next major event was the thing referred to as projectile vomiting. Is anyone familiar with that subject? I'm going to save you a lot of money today on your Sunday dinner, so if you just pay attention to me. Well, the next thing I know, I'm sitting there trying to play Sudoku with my iPad, and then there's a small coverage of my screen, and my suit pants is now adorned with what I don't want it to be adorned with. And so sometimes when I travel, if I eat, I get, you know, sloppy and everything. I get a stain on my tie, so I carry little, a little, little wipe things, and it, I found out which ones do it. They just take the stain right out of your bib, I mean your tie. And so I just took it out, and I tried to wipe my trousers with that, and she's so apologetic. And, and I uh, tried to clean off my my screen here. Maybe, just maybe, I need to talk to the flight attendant. So, when she got close to us, she said, ma'am, uh, if possible, could I change seats? She didn't even look. She put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Pastor, this is a full flight. I'm not a preacher, but if I was, I would tell you that I hope you have an enjoyable flight and choose not to be miserable. It's only two more hours to be miserable. Well, I'm not sure I believe all that much in some women preachers, but she preached to me that day a sermon that I'll not soon forget. Because whether you get hurt or offended or bothered, it's a choice. And I looked at the people in front of me. They were talking, laughing. How dare them? Guy over here is sleeping. She's back there listening to something with some Dr. Beats on there. $300 headphones. The, the little brat had too much sugar. His legs don't stop moving. He, he would have made a good j- jackhammer. So I stand up to reassess what I should do. And I looked at this one. They're okay. I look at that one. They're doing pretty good. This one over here is sleeping. They're talking heaven. I'm the only one that's, oh, the baby's sick. The fever's raging. And the child doesn't just have an upset stomach once or twice or three times. There's nothing left in that child's body that can come out, I'm sure. And I have uh, benefited from most. I now smell like the baby smells. I'm smiling, but I'm not happy. This is a twisted kind of sermon, isn't it? So I I sit back down. I tell myself, I still got the Holy Ghost. I'm still on my way to heaven. This is only going to last two more hours. Sometimes in life, you look at your situation and you feel like, they got a better deal than I got. And you would like to change seats with somebody else. But you see, 
I didn't pick this seat. They picked it for me. They're the ones that told me where to sit. And so now I have to sit here. There's some things in life that you would have never chosen. And you may not even like your life or what you're having to experience. But as far as I'm concerned in the things of God, there's no accidents. God knows what, what to do for you. God, God knows the way that I go. The steps of a good man and woman are ordered of the Lord. Isn't that what your Bible says? So here's what I want to do today. For the time remaining, I want to talk to you about my family. I don't want to know about yours. I have a very large family on my mother's side, over a hundred involved in the work of God. My cousins and aunts and uncles. My wife's side can pretty much rival that. Got a man sitting right over here that's a distant cousin of my wife sitting over here on the front row, Brother Henderson. My wife won't claim him, but that's not true. I apologize. My point is, I'm the eldest in my family. My wife is the eldest of all the star girls. So we're the ones that now that our parents are gone, we get calls. We know about stuff. Without naming names, can I just talk to you today? You would think that, oh, well, you're a preacher. You don't know what I'm going through. I will tell you, as a saint, you got folks that you can talk to and ask them for prayer. Who do you talk to when, you, when you're the pastor? Can you imagine a young mother, three children, been married 16 years? You put your husband through college he has never contributed one paycheck to the marriage to the family you have had to provide making candles selling things working the job and then one day he walks up to you and says I don't love you anymore I haven't loved you for three years. And you stand there in disbelief. You're the one that supported him. You tried to make excuses, thinking that as soon as you get done here, you're going to be a professor or something. And now you're a basket case. And you look at everybody else around you, they're having a good life. So you like, oh God, I wish I could change seats with somebody. This is not the life I had planned for myself. This is not where I wanted to wind up. I, all I wanted was somebody to love me. All I wanted was just somebody to love me back like I'm loving them. And then you see them pack their suitcase and stuff and move out of the house and get their own apartment. And you're a basket case. Or maybe I would talk to you about the young man who's married for less than 18 months. His baby runs down the aisle in church and the mother has to chess it. The baby's just trying to change seats. Okay, well, I got it. When you find out that your wife has had seven affairs with people in the church, besides the people at work, the first 18 months of your marriage, you give anything within your power to change seats with somebody. Say, God, I don't know how this happened to me, but I'd like to sit in a place with you. Or maybe I should tell you, uh, maybe I will name your name, my wife's youngest baby, or my wife's baby sister, uh, was six months old when we got married. Sarah, her husband, were pastoring in in Orange, California. Nice house. Doing the work of God. There was a slit in their plastic screen door. And the baby, less, less than two years old, crawled through that, out into the pool, and had to be life lighted to the hospital. I'm preaching a conference in Denver, and I put my wife on a plane at four o'clock in the morning 
My wife had a stroke in ICU being there with that baby. Nonstop for 36 hours. Lost, my wife lost half of her vision. The baby died. I can't tell you the grief in the family. And my wife's baby sister stood by the casket and sang the song about God's too good to be unkind. When you can't see his, what is it, his hand and trust his heart or trust his, I, I don't know the right words. The choir was behind her. There wasn't any dry eyes in the house. She said to her husband, well, I guess you'll fix the screen door now. For years, we cried and we cried and we cried. We still do. My wife, is not, even now, this week, has her arms around her little sister. She's grieving. She would give anything to change seats with mamas and daddies who've never lost a child. This is a full flight. I didn't pick this seat. They didn't pick this seat. They have to stay there. Or maybe when you hear that your daughter has breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and she's in panic. She's feeling the worst, and the doctor gives her the worst news ever. She's devastated at trying to be strong. She looks at the ticket, and she looks around. They're happy over here. They're having a great flight over yonder. They're, they're sleeping even. God, why do I have this life? Why did this happen to, happen to me? And if you're not careful... You could be so carnal and sinful in your thinking that you would say, if there was a God, how can he let this happen to me? Do not, do not charge God foolishly. One thing, and all that happened to Job, he didn't charge God foolishly. God, just because I stand up and stretch my legs doesn't change my circumstances. I can walk up and down the aisle, but this is still my seat. I can see what you're going through and I try to get a grip on myself. I don't want to stand here like a big baby and have a pity party. But this is not really what I bargained for when I got on, on this flight. I, I was told that I could have it my way. I, I was told by people in life that I, even by hamburger companies, that I could have it my way. That I was to have a good day and all this kind of things, but I'm not having a good day. This is not a good life. This is pain. I didn't sign up for pain. I didn't sign up for tears. I didn't sign up for heartache. You didn't sign up for the day when, as a husband, you, you can't put on your Mr. Fix-It hat and fix some things. You just have to hold your wife in your arms and cry with her. When your child runs away from home, you don't know if they're sleeping under a bridge what kind of people they're going to get caught up with and say, oh God, what did I do wrong? I wish I could change seats with somebody else. You can spend your life looking at other people, the car they're driving, the house they live in. God, you gave her a good looking husband. Look what you gave me. Their kids get A's and mine are on the flunkers on a roll. If we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. My first scripture was to say that godliness with contentment is great gain. You said to me yesterday, I believe it was, sister, that contentment is something we have to learn. Paul said that, I have learned. Some things don't come natural. And you sit beside a baby that's sick and got fever and it's got a bad, upset stomach. You don't like what's happening around you, but you can't move from where you're at. They don't let you. You're stuck here. And when your child backslides and walks out the door. Let me tell you, if you have no greater joy than to know that your children walk in truth, you have no greater pain when they don't walk in truth. When someone tells you, uh, I'm at a funeral. 
I'm at a funeral in, in Roswell, New Mexico, one month before I resigned. I didn't even know I was going to resign. My youngest son was in last year in high school. My wife called me. She said, honey, uh, I found out today that she called his name, so he'd been smoking since he was 13. And it's one of those deals where you got to sit down. No. Oh. And I busted out in tears. I, I didn't know. He wasn't the kind of kid that would be up in your face. He never once sassed me or my wife. Very obedient child. He was just his own problem. He wasn't trying to flop the world up in my face. My wife was crying, and I was crying. She said, and he's got two tattoos. Said, oh, God. No. And she said, I think he's been smoking marijuana. And I don't even know what else. I heard this about 6 o'clock at night. I'm in a nice motel. I got to drive two and a half hours, two hours or so. Albuquerque in the morning, catch a, a flight. I got to be there. Uh, I don't know, 10 o'clock. I have to teach a Bible study when I get home that night. So I'm driving down the road. Oh, I don't even go to sleep. I don't even get in bed. I pray. I walk the floor. I'm trashing myself. I must be the world's worst father. I'm trying to save the world and my own kids a zillion miles away from God. So I'm driving. If you ever have driven out in, in New Mexico, there's not a whole lot of folk on the road sometimes. I'm driving with my knee, looking at my little Franklin electronic Bible. This is about 1999. They didn't have iPads and iPhones back in the day. And I wanted to preach that night on the heart of the servant. And I see, I see where in Deuteronomy about verse chapter 28 it said if I remember 23 or 28 it said something like if a servant escape from his master unto thee return him not unto his master and I'm the kind of person I just talk to God when I pray I just conversational tone sometimes I talk I said God what does that mean does that mean I can't get my son restored to you surely that's not right Paul got Onesimus restored and then I got this this is what came to my mind next. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what came to my mind next. I had a, a mental picture of me going back and dragging somebody down to an altar while I was preaching. And just because I got your body down here doesn't mean I can get your heart down here. I don't even know if that's the right. If that's so okay, God, I'll, I'll receive that. What does it mean? <clears throat> Neither shalt thou oppress him. What does that mean? And the first thing that came to mind was, don't nag him, he already knows. And we're from one of these huggy, kissy, slurpy kind of families, my wife's side, my side. To this day, when I see my boys, they'll hug me, give me a, a smooch on the cheek. And there's not one precious boy in my family. If you call them precious, you're going to be missing two front teeth, I'll just tell you that. One of them will get to you. And I mean that in a good Christian way. But I, I, I tell my boys and my daughter every day, I love them, my wife. I love you has a very short shelf life. You've got to keep putting it back on the shelf every day. All you folks pay attention. So I always told him I love him. And then I remembered my daddy had never told me that he was proud of me until I was about 30. And we tend to parent like we were parented. If you're waiting for your child to be perfect, or your spouse or a friend to be perfect before you say you're proud of them, you'll wait a lifetime and may never get to say it. So I, as a man, I can compartmentalize and put stuff in this box and put stuff in that box. And if I separate the church from the world, from my home life, from my son, from my relationship with him, as a son, he was a good boy. He loved me. I loved him. He was respectful, all that kind of stuff. It was the church part that was killing me. I have no clue why I've gotten way off on this subject for the day. So I told God, I said, God, when I get home, I want to tell my son, I'm going to love my boy back in the church. 
I'm going to tell him I love him and that I'm proud of him. And if I have lied, you and me are going to have to talk later. I'm just giving you a heads up on what I'm going to do. I don't advise you to pray like I prayed. You may wind up where I'm at. I don't know. You don't want to be sitting by this baby right here. I walked in the door when I got home, put my arms around. He jumped and said, Dad. And so he got set and came over and he hugged me. We're back patterns, and so I'm thumping him on the back. I gave him a kiss on the cheek, and I rumpled his hair. I said, I love you, Dad. I always said, I love you too, Dad. I got him by the ears, and I seesawed his head back and forth. I said, I'm proud of you. And if I had a sucker punched him, he wouldn't have jerked his head in. I said, oh, no. He said, I'm proud of you. And I gave him another hug, and I could tell I was going to start getting kind of, uh, one of my eyes was going to start leaking if I stood there too much longer. And so I picked up my mess and I went to the bedroom, put my suitcase away, get ready for church start in an hour. My son goes into the kitchen. He said, Mama, did you tell Daddy that I've been smoking? I said, Yeah, honey, I told him. Did you tell him that, that I got tattoos? I said, Yeah, baby, he knows. He started crying. He said, Did you tell him that I've smoked marijuana? He falls into her arms and he said, Mama, how can Daddy say that he loves me, he's proud of me, when he knows what I've been doing? She said, honey, that's the Father's love. That's even the Heavenly Father's love. And I'll tell everybody in this house, I don't care what you've done, I don't care how you've been, what you have been, the Father still loves you today. I had a young man I went to my motel room at a camp meeting. He brought me a present, a $50 tie. I saw that he wanted to talk, and I had him sit down. He's starting a home missions church. He's starting a home missions church. He found a homeless man, taught him a home Bible study, and brought him to church. He got him baptized, got him prayed through the Holy Ghost. Helped the man get a job. The man was sleeping under a bridge. He got him a little place to stay cheap, and he got him a job in a car, a little clunker. He had just finished the 10th lesson of the home, home Bible studies, and just one night before church, he had to lead the songs. He had to do the preaching, home missions. Knock came on the door. He opened up, and there's the man standing right there. And the man said, he said, praise the Lord. Well, hello. And the man said, hello. And he looked past him. And he turned to see what he was looking at. And this man started crying. And he said, that my wife walked up to me and handed me our newborn baby. I said, here, you can have the baby. I'm going with him. And she walked out the door and got in his car and drove off. He said, I stood there and bawled like a baby. I went to church that night and I had to give my baby to a grandma there in the church to hold it while I led the song singing about the goodness of God. Because that night I was going to preach about how good God was. I can only imagine he'd like to change seats with somebody. I could tell you about folks raised in foster homes or victims of child abuse or neglect. They'd love to change seats. My daddy died of Alzheimer's in 1994. I was 50. I was walking through the Ontario Mills Mall with my father on my arm. He had preached to 15,000 people with his notes on the back of a calling card. I can't even testify good compared to my daddy. He was a preacher. And he was, in my mind, of course I'm a son, but I thought my father was the prince of preachers. And here's my father going through the mall like this. 74 years old. I held my head up high because this is my daddy. This is my hero. And I'm proud of my daddy. And I saw a guy about 85, looked like years old, come by. And he's got a muscle shirt on, a big cigar, and wearing Speedo. Try to get that out of your mind and flip-flops 
and a young blonde honey on his arm, and he is cursing, and would, oh, he's doing a good enough job, sailors would took notes. The man was cussing in the mall. And he walked in front of me about 10 feet away. Well, my dad and I are going, my dad is kind of doing this. And I said out loud, God, why are you letting that old buzzard live? I said, if my daddy, I said, he's cursing your name. If my daddy had that much strength, think what a blessing he could be to your kingdom. I was a preacher. I knew not to say stupid stuff like that. But the son in me was fighting for my daddy. I didn't like my daddy having to sit in his seat. And John chapter 21 came to my mind. Peter's sitting there on the shore and he's divvying up the catch. One for you, and two for me, and one for you, and three for me. And he's dividing up the catch. Sadly enough, nowadays, a lot of churches don't go fishing anymore. They just divvy up the catch. But that's a sermon for another day. And Jesus said to Peter, Lovest thou me more than these? Oh, yeah, sure, Lord, I love you more than this one for you. And three times the Lord says it, and he uses a more powerful word on lovest thou me. And then the Lord, some of you folks with gray hair or no hair can understand this. He turned the record over. He said, when thou wast young, you went whithersoever thou wouldest. But when thou art old, another shall lead thee where thou wouldest not, shall dress thee and lead thee where thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by which death he should glorify God. How in the world does God get any glory on you having to sit in the seat that you're sitting in? I'm not saying that that meant Alzheimer's or dementia, what Jesus was saying, but look at it this way. He was strong. Jesus was saying Peter's going to be strong enough to stand, but he couldn't put his own clothes on. He could walk, but he didn't have enough orientation to get to where he needed to go or be brought back. Somebody had to lead him. And Peter got very bothered. He said, well, what about him? And Jesus said, if I let him live till I come again, what's that to you? Follow thou me. Twice he said, follow thou me. My point, brothers and sisters, is that no matter what you're having to go through, all God asks you to do is be faithful. I've seen folks backslide and go leave church because stuff didn't turn out the way that they wanted it to. It's all because they didn't like the seat they were sitting in. The last time I saw my father ever worship and cry in church and respond in worship, a man got up behind the pulpit with an old box guitar and he sang, Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. And I saw my daddy cry. He knew he had Alzheimer's. We had talked about it when he was in the early stages. I said, what's it like, daddy, to have this? He had a lucid day. He said, it's kind of like being in prison. I can hear people talking to me, but I can't make myself respond. I want to talk. I got the words I want to say. I want my hands to move in my mouth, but it don't. I, I can't. It's like being in jail. You'd have to change suits with somebody. David even felt that way. He said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I, I, I'd fly away. I'd change seats with somebody, but you can't always leave the you in. Women in my church, Sister Lowry and, and, and Mother Willis, when they stood up to testify, you better reach for your Kleenex when you see them stand up because when they get done, them girls get done, your heart's going to be jerked out and stomped on. she hand it back to you, but you're going to be a mess when you get it back. Do you know how they had that touch of God and that New Jerusalem ring to their testimony? They lived with devils at home. They had to go through no telling what. They were life to change seats. I preached several conferences, and I, I want my musicians to get ready to come, if you will. Go ahead and stand with me. I, I preached several con conferences with a brother, Morel Cornwell, <clears throat> the last 10 years. He told his story. He told a story about uh, a man come up to him and said, Brother Cornwell, I know you've taught over 25,000 home Bible studies. 
you've built a church up to a mega church. He said, would you lay hands on me and pray for me that God would give me your ministry? Oh, he said, I'd be, I'd be honored to. He said, stand right here. He laid his hands on the young man's head and said, God, let this man go bankrupt two times, lose everything he's got, let his family turn, turn against him and disown him, let him get sick and nearly die. And I said, hey, 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 hey. He said, I don't want to go through that. He said, well, that's how I got this ministry. And sometimes the seat, 10D, is what makes you the person that you are. Could it ever be that you understand the scripture that says God hath chosen you in the furnace of affliction? But when we come through this, we're going to be like pure gold, tried. I wouldn't wish pain on an enemy. I wouldn't wish heartache on an enemy. My last scripture says this. Let your lifestyle or your conversation be without covetousness, wishing that you were someplace else. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When you stand up the next time on this plane, look around. You're going to see him sitting somewhere close. Because he said, I'll never leave you. Sometimes I can't see him. I look on the left, um, left side, right side, I don't see him, but I look on the left, I, I know he's working with me for my good. I can't see him, but I know he's there for me. You know what I'd like for you all to do today? This has been the most unusual sermon I know. Just come and stand with me around the front. Everybody here believes in prayer. While we have a song, lift your hands, your hearts, your faith, your hope to God. You didn't pick the seat that you're having to sit in. All he's asked you to do is be faithful. We're going to land in two more hours. Choose to have a good flight.